So the possible etiologies and complicating factors of this disease. Unquestionably, there's genetic predisposition. The specifics of the genetics, we don't know, but this is part of what needs to be done in the research. We need to do twin studies. We need to be looking at what's happening because there are families that get struck with this disease. The mother, the father, the children. And we need to find out what it is genetically going on that predisposes people to development of this disease. Obviously, as we've talked about infections, the Epstein-Barr virus has been well documented in a subset of these people to be responsible for the continuation of the disease. And if we treat that uh, chronic viral infection, we can get people better. Other viruses has also been associated with disease. Enterovirus is a huge list. But these are the two that uh, predominate in terms of that list. Lyme disease is a question, but personally I believe Lyme diseases can also present as, uh, as myalgic encephalomyelitis. Environmental issues, which we talked about in terms of heavy metals and molds, immunizations, the various traumas, cardiac issues, pots which show up but then reinforce the problem because it creates a relative ischemia, loss of blood flow to the brain, which causes further inflammation in the central nervous system. So the problem with these conditions is they're not just the things that are a consequence of the disease, they are things that reinforce the continuation of the disease. So you have to identify all of these things and pick them off one at a time. Because if you're not going after all this stuff, you're going to get an incomplete result. You need to do a comprehensive and individualized treatment plan. So we've got to do the best we can to find the etiologies of these conditions. Meditation is neuroregenerative. It reduces inflammation in the central nervous system. It's a thing that can be used. Exercise is highly controversial. Telling people to push through it is completely, totally, absolutely wrong. Okay, you cannot exercise these people that way. We want to keep them moving as much as possible, but you're always behind their point of fatigue. You don't want to bring them to that because the consequences of bringing them to a point of exertional fatigue are devastating in terms of serious setback for the disease and potential leaving them bedridden for an extended period of time. So we need to be careful and thoughtful if we're going to recommend any kind of an exercise program for these people. Obviously, we want to keep them moving, but at the same time, we need to be very careful about how much movement. Nutritional issues need to be addressed. Sleep, cardiac issues, as we've already discussed. Medications, we'll talk about a few of those. Acupuncture, a few studies suggesting that that's been useful. Psychotherapy, it is important to not treat these people as if they're crazy. It is important to not treat these people as if they're depressed. Now, depression can manifest along with this because that's a manifestation of a brain inflamed. Anxiety can present along with this because that's a manifestation of a brain that's inflamed. Okay, these are symptoms of the inflammation. But that doesn't mean that that's the cause and the problem. And so lots of studies have been done cognitive behavioral therapies looking at people suffering with this disease. And for the most part, it's not effective. So there is a time and a place for psychotherapy for these individuals, as there's a time and a place for all people who get sick. But it should not be the primary uh, modality for treating this condition because that's not the primary issue. Physical therapy, again, we want to be able to keep moving as best we can. And then detoxification programs, looking at issues with yeast, looking at issues with other chemical sensitivities. GI disorders that we've talked about in terms of yeast and bacterial overgrowth. There's, in particular, uh, there's a, a type of bacteria in the gut, a clostridial species, which produces a uh, organic acid called HPHPA. HPHPA is a neurotoxin. Uh, and in several individuals, we have uh, successfully identified uh, this as a problem for them, treated this, which need to be treated with antibiotics, uh, and with the eradication of that, we've seen dramatic improvement in their symptoms. Is this true for everybody? No. But it clearly is something we need to pay attention to, look at it, and treat it when we find it, because we know that it can at least be a contributing factor. There's been three major treatment versus placebo trials showcasing the potential benefits of three drugs, Amplogen, Valcite, and uh, Rituxan. Amplogen was one of the most promising looking of the drugs. It's antiviral and an immune modulator, and it seemed to produce uh, objective improvement in exercise duration and work tolerance activities of daily living. There's a performance goal called uh, Karnofsky. Uh, reduced dependence on drugs used to relieve myalgic encephalomyelitis symptoms. However, the FDA looked at this and said, you know, the quality of life measurements were not significantly budged with this drug, 
and it didn't feel that there was enough evidence based on the studies uh, that they had to recommend uh, the medication. So this medication is not available to people with um, myalgic encephalomyelitis at this time. Valsite, Jose Montoya at Stanford, who also is on this committee, has done several studies. They're smallish studies looking at uh, the possibility of an antiviral agent uh, to treat HHV6, uh, and persistent HHV6, and uh, persistent Epstein-Barr virus. He saw a significant improvement in fatigue. As I said, the trials are small. Uh, we use Valcide in the office. We have a number of patients we've treated with this medication. It is hardly a home run across the board, but we also have seen uh, a number of patients who have dramatically improved on the medication. It's a medication that you need to take for an extended period of time. You need to be on this for nine months to a year and sometimes longer. It's a medication that can have fairly significant side effects, inclusive of bone marrow suppression and liver damage. So it's a medication that needs to be monitored closely. We don't use it lightly. We want to be clear that we've met the criteria for utilizing it. But in that subset of patients uh, <coughs> where we've seen the elevated titers on them for Epstein-Barr and HHB6, uh, it has been a useful medication. And we've seen significant improvement. Rituxan. Rituxan is a monoclonal antibody that destroys immune system B cells. All right. This is a medication which has been shown in trials to be helpful, but again, quality of life scores did not actually improve in this, despite the fact that the objective measurements looked like they were improving. This drug has been approved for non-Hodgkin's lymphoma and uh, rheumatoid arthritis. It, is, it has to be administered uh, by an IV infusion, intravenous infusion. Uh, we've got small trials uh, that have been done in the past. We need bigger trials. Um, it's not an inconsequential drug to give to people. It's not an inexpensive drug to give to people. And so for the most part, it is not available because it's not approved by the FDA for this condition. And if you want to uh, take it outside of FDA approval, you have to pay for it out of pocket, which pretty much is out of range for almost everybody. So <clears throat> rituxan under trials, but as of yet not approved. So these are the three drugs that at least have been looked at uh, and show potential promise in terms of treating this condition. So overall, our treatment must be guided by our understanding of the pathophysiology. Our pathophysiology to date tells us that we have an underlying neuroinflammatory disease. All right, treatment must be holistic and comprehensive. So you've got to do <coughs> all of the things that we've talked about looking at in terms of digestive issues and sleep issues, utilizing things like meditation, utilizing um, all of the alternative therapies that we have available to us as they seem appropriate, okay, and the medications as they seem appropriate. So it's a comprehensive treatment program that's directed at multi-system treatment. You're rarely going to be successful if you treat the thing because it, this is a disease that is typically not the thing. It's usually multiple things that have added up. Plug for my book, Total Recovery, and uh, a lot of what we talk about here, a lot of what I've gone over here in terms of case studies and, and laying out this whole business of a neuroinflammatory model is applicable to what's going on in myalgic encephalomyelitis. Okay, specifically when I began my research and where I was focused on was in chronic pain and the co-occurrence of uh, depressive disorders, which we've now labeled as central sensitization syndrome. So chronic pain occurring with anxiety disorders, with um, depressive disorders, post-traumatic syndrome, uh, <clears throat> all of this really correlates with inflammation in the central nervous system. And so our model of treatment is based around this inflammatory model. I think this model is equally applicable to what we're doing with uh, chronic fatigue syndrome. We have more to learn on this. This is not the end of it, but at least it's the beginning that's allowing us to make inroads with a number of patients. Would that we could be successful with the overwhelming majority of patients we see, we're not. We see a very end-stage population. We see people who have been through multiple other centers uh, and multiple other physicians before they get to us. It's not unusual for someone to have seen 15 other physicians uh, before we have an opportunity to work with them. But we still see overall about a 50% success rate in that population. So we're still batting pretty well considering the population we're working with. And we believe that if we could apply these principles much earlier for people, that they, we'd have even a higher success rate uh, before the disease really uh, gets totally entrenched. So I hope this has been useful for you. This is a complex disease. We don't have quick and easy answers. 
Uh, there's an evolving consensus that's coming to a new definition of the disease and hopefully a proper name for this disease. Uh, and most importantly, that we're going to see uh, real uh, legitimate funding efforts uh, on the part of NIH and other agencies so that we can do the work we need to do to find out what's going, what the path of, true path of physiology is of this disease and how we can best go about uh, finding solutions for this. This is a group of patients suffering mightily and has been horribly neglected uh, by the medical establishment to date. Hopefully we are on the verge of making that change. So thank you for your attention and have a pleasant evening. Mm -hmm.